Uh, we have a fascinating panel with great speakers to discuss recent development in securities regulation. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, our speakers and invite them to join us. Uh, Anat Gueta is the um, chair of the Israel Securities Authority. Uh, to our US guests, I will just say that before uh, that position, she was the founder of the CEO of Entropy Research, which is the Israeli equivalent of the ISS, and, and, and now she's the chair of the ISA. Khaled Kaboub is uh, um, a deputy president, that's how I translated, of the Tel Aviv District Court, and a judge, one of the founding judges of the Economic Division. And again, to our US guests, I would just mention that unlike the Delaware Chancery Court, uh, the Economic Division in Israel uh, hears uh, securities cases, both civil and criminal. And our last speaker, uh, Rob Jackson, is a commissioner at Israel. At, uh, Israel. Is a, maybe that would be his next position, is a commissioner uh, at the SEC. Uh, one of the great, uh, uh, one of the leading law professors in the US. And, and do the singles here get too excited about this uh, uh, description, don't get your hopes too high. As of you know, two weeks ago, he just recently got married, and this is actually part of his honeymoon. So our speakers, please uh, join us on the stage. You missed the cake. OK, so our first speaker is going to be uh, Anat. Uh, Anat, you have roughly 10 minutes to describe your thoughts about Israel securities regulation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, oh. Hello and good morning everyone. I'm now going to talk on a second thought on minority veto rights which is, as some of you may know, a subject that is very close to my heart. So at the beginning of this decade, three significant and important reforms transformed the Israeli capital market, which led us to our current reality. And as you may know, all of you, I suppose, Professor Zohar Goshen, my dear friend and mentor, was a primary initiator of all three reforms. The reforms are as follows. The establishment of a, an economic department in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, in the, in the Tel Aviv District Code, sorry. The amendment to the, to the securities law, adding administrative enforcement tools to the Israeli Securities Authority. And finally, the third one is amendment number 16 to the company's law which was partially based on the recommendations of the Goshen Committee on Corporate Governance. Establishing the economic department in the district code was designed to create judicial specialization and to accelerate decision making on matters related to corporate and securities law. Administrative enforcement was designed to diversify the enforcement tools available to the ISA and allow it to bring offenders to justice quickly and efficiently when offenses do not warrant criminal prosecution. And amend amendment number 16 to the company's law significantly increased the power of minority shareholders by determining that the adoption of certain types of decisions required approval of a higher majority of minority shareholders. The most significant issue affected by these majority requirements was the approval of transactions in which the controlling shareholders had a personal interest in them. This requirement was extended in the latter years and also to executive remuneration policies. This special minority approval mechanism is designed to prevent the potential abuse of power by a controlling shareholder. As a whole, there is nothing negative about having a controlling shareholder in a public company. <laughs> 
and we are all aware of the fact that there are very positive controlling shareholders who make significant contributions to their companies. The same applies to transactions involving controlling shareholders. Some can benefit the companies, and in such cases, the minority shareholders may gain by approving them. Still, the transactions themselves are under suspicion because the controlling shareholder has a personal interest in them. This is the law. The current situation in Israel is that several types of actions require approval of majority of the minority shareholders, this requirement applies to potentially suspicious activities such as related party transactions that affect a potential conflict of interest between the company and its controlling shareholder, as I just mentioned before. But it also applies to actions that do not have a proven conflict of interest, such as approval of the CEO's remuneration or approval of the unified role as the CEO as the chairman of the board. Consequently, the Israeli law gives shareholders the power to prevent transactions that do not entail a clear conflict of interest between the company and its controlling shareholder. And as a result, minority shareholders now have broad veto powers. Such power exists even in the case of an excellent controlling shareholder whose actions can actually benefit the company, as well as actions in which his or her interests are identical or similar to the interests of those minority shareholders. Now, let's have a look on comparative law. In the United States and in Europe, there are also mechanisms that determine that related party transactions must be approved by a majority of minority shareholders at a general meeting. The mechanisms differ both with respect to the types of transactions that require such approval and also with respect to the extent of required implementation of this mechanism. In Delaware, for example, this mechanism provides protection from a broad judicial review, but is not a condition for the execution of the transaction. The big distinction I see is that the Israeli market undertook three major reforms within a relatively very short period of about one year. And in addition, there was another significant reform about three years later only, related to executive remunerations, which is exceptional in global standards. Executive remuneration approval that isn't linked to the controlling shareholder now requires a special majority instead of a sound pay mechanism as the global standard. The CEO remuneration now requires a special majority instead of board approval and the mandatory cap on executive remuneration in the financial sector was adopted around this time as well. We may distinguish between two different systems of reforms. The reforms that were designed to create state corporate governance mechanisms, which are the economic department in the district court and administrative enforcement tools. And the reforms that were designed to provide market corporate governance mechanisms, which are the minority veto rights and active behavior by institutional investors that is enabled by the Israeli corporate law. The market mechanisms were in fact devised in response to the continual increasing holdings of institutional investors. This was a significant development in capital markets worldwide that also affected Israel. Today, the share of institutional investors in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange doubled within a decade from 23% to 47%. This was also accompanied by institutional investors' increased activism with their ability to influence public companies. In this context, it is worth noting that certain rights granted to the Israeli institutional investors are effectively exercised 
only with respect to Israeli companies that are listed only in Israel, and not with Israeli companies that are traded only abroad. Furthermore, the Israeli companies law clearly does not apply to institutional and investor investors' holdings in non-Israeli companies that are listed abroad. Such differences have an adverse effect on the local market and potentially diminish its appeal for potential issuers. And what was the result of those reforms? From an optimistic perspective, we can talk about the positive effects. Establishing the economic department in the district code facilitated a rapid resolution of civil legal disputes as well as criminal cases. The new administrative enforcement tools made it possible to handle a larger number of offenses. The amendments to the company's law increased minority shareholders' power and reduced the controlling premium over time. But what are the negative implications of those reforms? Aren't we seeing a surge in litigation and legal proceeding in the capital market in response to the establishment of the economic department? Have the new administrative enforcement tools created over deterrence of executives? Have the amendments to the company's law created an excessive burden on companies operating in the capital market? Well, the answers to these questions remain to be determined. And we are all familiar with the argument that the decline in the number of public companies and reduced desire of new companies to go public is the result of an overbearing regulation. This decline actually stems from a series of causes rather than a single factor. It is, however, undeniable that regulation can also lead to the listing, especially when several significant reforms are undertaken concurrently in a relatively very short period. We have no way of knowing whether the delisted companies generated more value to their shareholders after they became private, or what would have happened had they remained public companies. But the fact that they delisted indicates that the step was economically viable for the controlling shareholder, assuming she acted rationally. Otherwise, they would not have invested efforts and money to do so. That is to say, from the controlling shareholder's perspective, the delisting transaction reflected a higher company value on the eve of the transaction. When the reforms I mentioned earlier were undertaken, they were, they, they were adopted on the basis of the specific merits of each reform, rather than an examination of the potential effects in total. And while each of these reforms makes sense, was their combined adoption was justified? Are these reforms to some extent substitutional? Is there a need for powerful regulatory tools when effective market mechanisms are in place. So after all, a balance between the mechanisms is required if the goal is to attain a high yet not excessive standard of corporate governance. Were that not enough, the three major reforms were joined by additional legislative amendments that added to the costs of companies' maintenance on the market. The first of these amendments was Amendment Number 20 to the company's law, adopted in 2014, which extended the minority shareholders' veto power to companies' remuneration policies and CEO employment terms. From an international perspective, this was also an exceptional amendment. The second amendment, adopted in 2016, limited the salaries of executives in the financial sector, as well as investment managers in the institutional bodies. And I believe that it is reasonable to assume that this amendment also affected policy of voting of institutional investors on executive remuneration of non-financial firms that were not intended to be affected by this amendment.
As Goshen and Hamdani's recent research released this month titled Corporate Control and the Limits of Judicial Review elaborates, it is too often difficult to quantify or estimate in advance of the difference between the agency costs created by a controlling shareholders there is, the cost of private benefits of control, and the added value that the controlling shareholders generates for all shareholders through her management. Therefore, in some cases, a controlling owner's added value to the firm may exceed the value of agency costs that she imposes, yet the minority shareholders may nonetheless decide to exercise their the veto rights due to a miscalculation or simply negligence. The possible outcome of these cases could be the abandonment of those executives and owners who provide a positive value to the companies and will represent a de facto blow to the firm's value and to its minority shareholders as well. And the question that I would like to pose here is whether the far-reaching experiment conducted in the Israeli capital market in the past decade has truly yielded positive results? And if so, in what aspects of the market do they manifest? Another question that is warranted is whether the broad veto power granted to minority shareholders in Israel could ultimately have a detrimental impact on the market values of existing public companies. All this brings me to the in-depth study made by Oded Cohen and Dr. Roy Stein from the Bank of Israel. This impressive study that was not published yet but will be published in the next few months shed some light on this issue. In this study, the researchers developed an index of corporate governance quality based on 27 to 31 firm level control factors. These factors cover almost all dimensions of firm, operation, of firm operations that have significant for corporate governance, like dividends, profit management, debt settlement, remuneration, related party transactions, probability of insolvency, to name a few. The study covers the period from 2007 to 2014, a period that coincides with the major reforms described before, and the sample includes 127 firms. Among other things, the researchers used the Corporate Governance Quality Index to investigate the connection between firm level and state level indices of corporate governance quality. State level corporate governance quality is typically unaffected by internal firm mechanisms. Corporate governance quality affects all firms equally through non-voluntary practices. The question is, what is the relationship between firm-level corporate governance and state-level corporate governance? It is an exchangeable relationship because the government forces low-quality corporate governance firms to meet a high standard of investor protection. And it is also supplementary because good firms can prove that their mechanisms are more reliable. These researchers found that the reforms adopted in 2011 established a high level of minimum standard of investor protection, independently on the firm's internal mechanisms. More, spe more specifically, the reforms compensated for the low standard of corporate protection, of corporate governance, sorry, in certain firms by setting standards of investors' protection. That is to say, the reforms created a compensatory effect between the protective mechanisms that the firm provided and the mechanisms that the state provided. In terms of effects on firm value, the reforms reduced the potential for controlling private benefits. And we all know about recent studies that show that controlling premiums in Israel are on the decline. Cohen and Stein demonstrated that private benefits of control motivated controlling shareholders to remain in the market. 
After the adoption of the reforms in 2011, this situation was reversed and firms with a dominant controlling shareholder showed a greater tendency to delist. Therefore, according to this study, it appears that the market's response to amendment number 16 was positive and the market considered controlling owners who used the powers to get private benefits as having a detrimental impact on their firm's value. But this is only a single study on a single issue, amendment number 16. And I hope that maybe you and other researchers will face, the, will face the challenge and conduct similar studies on the overall indications of these legislations and its results. I would also like to remind us, the regulators, to look always at the bigger picture and view the regulatory map as a puzzle in which all the pieces must fit correctly in order to create a holistic picture. Sometimes you may have a piece that is pleasing for itself but does not fit into the puzzle or you may have a puzzle with many similar pieces. Well, it's not easy and it's especially not easy to assess in advance the outcomes of each step or the combined impact of a number of steps. But I believe that it is our duty to do so. So thank you very much.